Thanks very much, Tim, for those kind words. Uh, very much appreciated. And if I could just add my welcome as well to Keith and Sue, it's really fantastic to see you visiting Wollongong and Mari from the Academy as well. <clears throat> OK, as you may have noticed already, as Sod's Law would have it, and that's the universal Sod's Law, not the original one that relates to slices of toast falling on the floor, uh, I've gradually acquired a, uh, my voice has been disappearing over the last three weeks, so I have a three days, I should say. I have a various things here which will help hopefully keep me going, but if I change modulation and suddenly become very deep, that would be because that's the only way I can keep talking. Um, anyhow, so, um, no, I don't want to go there quite yet. Um, let's get the right set of notes out. And thanks to the Academy for organising the lecture here. It's really very much appreciated. And it is so relevant for us now because three out of our five faculties in the new structure are covered by the sort of disciplines that Murray had up before. Pretty much all of business, all of social sciences, and you know, maybe a half to two thirds of the Faculty of Law, Humanities and the Arts. So this is absolutely uh, perfect timing for us to build that relationship with the Academy. Increasingly, we understand that who each of us is today is in part the product of hereditary genetic changes of our ancestors, sometimes stretching back over long periods of time. Historic events, individual or collective, cause mutations in our genes by changing their DNA sequence. By mapping our own genes, we can discover far, far more about our inherited biological makeup, its strengths and its fragilities such as the degree to which we are prone to particular life-threatening diseases. What scientists have taught us about ourselves empowers the importance of history in its many forms, including, for this case, economic history. Economies mutate as well, except economists don't talk about mutations. They talk about shifting equilibriums. And such changes can have a major impact across many generations. That's better. You can, you can, that one still works as well, doesn't it? Yeah. War, for example, is often viewed by historians as shifting economic equilibriums in a remarkable number of ways. War, of course, most naturally requires reconstruction, reinvestment, but it also leads to a rethinking of economic values. It can lead to a reshaping of social and political institutions that can impact on the economy. So in Britain, for example, after 1945, the first major uh, majority Labour government nationalised large parts of manufacturing industry, uh, introduced a comprehensive free national service, national health service, amongst many other changes. And it's interesting that if we look at something like war, we can also see how uh, war can also cause genetic mutations through exposure to highly traumatic events, either individual events or of collective events. So that sort of comes together like that. And indeed, war is a good example of the convergence of uh, economic and genetic uh, impacts, economic and genetic mutations. Modern human capital theory, which economists talk about a lot, which is really just about the importance of skill and human capability and so forth in economic development. Modern human capital theory shows that health and the condition of the population has an immense bearing on economic outcomes. Thus, that relationship between genetic mutation and economic change is an important one. Where is this going, you're probably realising. Our modern economy, institutions, structures, forms of behaviour, has the genetic fingerprints of history smeared all across it. So, how can we identify and interpret those fingerprints? Without the same set of tools, the same set of experiments available to natural scientists. Economics is not as much of a science as some of its practitioners would have us believe. It's less of a dismal science, as it's sometimes called, and more of an enriching social science. Human behaviour is, of course, unpredictable and difficult to generalise and model. Historical experience must, therefore, I believe, be central to our public discourse about economic developments. And really, that's what I want to talk about today. Who drives those economic narratives? Where is there a role for history in informing and, and contributing to those economic narratives? It was suggested earlier that uh, there are a few countries, like Australia, for the extent of economic debate. Uh, but I'd suggest equally that there are 
few countries perhaps where history has had uh, a comparable or sufficient input into that economic debate. So behind every policy strategy or government or, or of government or business lies a narrative statement that contextualises and justifies a course of action. So let me give a few examples of recent ones you'll be familiar with. Immigration increases unemployment. Labour's public debt is unsustainable. Manufacturing's decline will damage our economic prospects. City growth is unsustainable. Who develops these narratives and how well informed are they? We have many narrators of the public discourse of economics. The media, political parties, public sector bodies, business and indeed universities, each with their own set of interests and values. Too often, I would argue, they are ahistorical or use history uh, to serve, use in a pejorative sense, to serve predetermined perspectives. Let me give some examples of this, and I have some rude things to say about the media, but I'm sorry, that's, that's just it. Uh, few would deny that uh, the media uh, has enormous power in influencing public opinion and policy makers. And the, 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 the almost unrestrained arrogance in the way that this hits our face, uh, and I put up an example of that that I noticed recently in my, dare I say, my subscription to The Australian, the home of comments, authority, perspective, depth, depth. Uh, and um, um, the, we only need to listen to them, obviously. And if you think it's just coming from Australia, think, uh, look at some of the other places where we get this same uh, media arrogance. This is, uh, this is taken from Time magazine, to which I, for some reason, also have a subscription. Might that, let that one lapse as well? Yeah, I don't know how well you can read that. It's a bit small. In an era when information threatens to overwhelm us, it's more crucial than ever to choose the right decisions to ask. Time's guide to everything you need to know. Page 32. And some of the things we have there. What is the good life? Oh, that's worth knowing. Uh, questions we should be asking, questions we thought we had no answers, and questions we didn't know we had, which is a bit Donald Rumsfeldian, questions we didn't even know we didn't know, so to speak. And that's, the, that's, uh, that's Time magazine. Um, and it becomes quite serious when these discourses become uh, mobilising discourses. Assertions of authority reinforced with headlines, editorials, conferences, self-promoted books then featuring back in the newspapers by author journalists. Uh, and uh, just to give a plug to one of our local authors recently, uh, uh, Professor Luke McNamara won a prize for an article he published looking at this concept of mobilising discourses in the media. Uh, had a read of it the other day, very good. Battle lines are drawn. These are, these are contested discourses as well. Um, this, this is uh, uh, quite, quite remarkable, really. Um, so the Australian Financial Review, which might consider itself as traditionally having some sort of say in, um, in business and views on business, uh, and it has this back page art, uh, comment called Jean de Clare, which has gone through various, various people who have written it over the years, some of whom have gone over to the Australian. Fox is in the Chook House. So there's a big challenge to the uh, Australian Financial Review's uh, quasi-monopoly of business reporting or business opinions, more like it. Uh, in the media. The, the sustained attacks on the ABC are well known, or a conflict, I should say, between the ABC and the Australian. Um, Ross Giddens, you may, is a good friend of the University of Wollongong, uh, who writes an economics uh, column for the Sydney Morning Herald, uh, and is generally referred to by the Murdoch Pross Press as the Git. Uh, indeed, Andrew Bolt wrote recently, Gittins, Gittins is, well, a complete git. Um, and that's unfortunate for an economic historian, and the reason for that is that the Gitz, if we want to call him that, is a rare advocate of economic history and has written articles such as his 2011 piece entitled Economic History Ignored Leads to the Inevitable, and the inevitable, of course, is to repeat the errors of history. Uh, and Gittins often draws on economic history to inform his opinions in the media. So here is a nice example of somebody who does do that. And I noticed uh, a couple of weeks ago that he was criticised by the Australian for using outdated Keynesian economic theory 
going back to the 1930s. And of course, there's this left-right thing, the left sort of more associated with Keynesianism and the right with, 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 with uh, monetarism or free trade or laissez-faire and so forth. And I thought that was a bit ironic when you think that uh, the views associated with laissez-faire and free trade predate Keynes by a century, maybe two centuries, maybe 1775. So, you know, historians don't mind that it's old economic theory as long as it's good theory. And business. Uh, so business, obviously, a lot of uh, commentary, economic commentary comes from business. Ten years ago, I co-authored a book called The Big End of Town, which was a uh, business history of large-scale enterprise in Australia in the 20th century. And that term, Big End of Town, is a quintessentially Australian term. Uh, indeed, if you Google it, you'll find it, almost all of the references to it come from Australian sources. And the reason for this, and we, you confirm this in the in the statistical part of that book was that Australia's big business sector is more concentrated, more dominant over the enterprise sector as a whole in Australia than in almost any other country. And so therefore you start to think about how that shapes opinion, business opinion and their input into uh, economic narratives and economic commentary. And it's interesting to note uh, yesterday that the Prime Minister was addressing the Business Council of Australia to talk about uh, rallying their support for tax reform and seemed somewhat surprised that the Labour opposition was not ready to rally behind an increase in the GST, which is effectively a regressive tax. Government, of course, from sort of leading on to that, political parties and their backers uh, have a particular narrative to, to pursue, but what is, I suppose, concerning for historians and economic historians in particular is the way it, 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 it gives uh, entirely false accounts of history. So, so their view of what has happened in previous economic policy is simply to um, lambast those economic policies of other political parties and to exalt the qualities and capabilities of their prior policy as well. And um, I think, you know, the level of our political debate and political commentary on the economic narrative uh, has has descended to a, to a degree. It hasn't kept up with the wealth that those economic le legacies have provided to Australia. <clears throat> and I noticed in today's Australian, Paul Kelly, I think, has, has invented, or maybe he thinks he's invented, maybe somebody knew it already, a new Australia. We had the lucky country, we had the clever country, and he's now saying we have the stupid country. And... Um, uh, although he has a particular reason for saying that, and that, that is this GST debate and the question about you know, uh, Commonwealth reform of governments, uh, he does say, and to quote him just from this morning's papers, a nation uh, unable to solve its public policy problems and even worse, incapable of conducting a public debate about them. And he's critical of both sides of politics when he says that. <clears throat> so. Where is history in this economic narrative, uh, you ask, or I'm asking this evening? <clears throat> uh, unfortunately, amongst those many claimants, the voice of economic history has remained largely silent or selectively galvanised to prosecute particular perspectives. To show that I'm not sort of giving any political bias here, I should mention that uh, the recent review of the national curriculum by our current governments uh, expose the ignorance of economic history or lack of economic history being taught in our schools. Three times in that review, it chastises the lack of economic history in our schools as reflected in the current national curriculum. What about the teaching of economic history in universities? <clears throat> this has become in many ways the victim of organisational pressures, pushing out small disciplines and intellectual trends which perhaps haven't favoured economic history. This is where I run in danger of upsetting historians or economists, but anyhow, I will make these points. Um, <clears throat> economics has sort of moved away from economic history. It has looked more towards um, methodology, technical correctness, robust econometrics, more than an interest in the context of history. Um, <clears throat> history, on the other hand, has moved away in the last 10 years from the uh, whys of, of economic history to the hows of cultural history. There's a very clear shift away from economic history in the mainstream economic history discipline. And just to make sure that I um, um, 
I have many long friends in economics. I show you my favorite cartoon about economists. Um, <clears throat> I've been around economists for a long time. I know they won't take offence. Uh, <laughs> moreover, universities have become much more corporatized in their world view. A recent history talks about an epidemic, not an academic, an epidemic of DVCs, and certainly the growth in size of universities, and Wollongong is an example of universities that's grown very, very quickly, uh, has required, not surprisingly, greater emphasis on management of governance of these expanded resources and increased marketing and promotion. Research, and maybe this is my uh, cynical view of it, has to be seen to be probably contemporary, immediately relevant, photogenic, and financially rewarding. And of course, there are no big dollars in history. Whether history is photogenic, I don't know, maybe social history is, I'm not so sure. Economic history is, that's why I have to slip cartoons in, because the next stuff becomes all graphs and tables and so forth. So who is addressing the big economic questions if we can't find it addressed in economics or history, and economic history is somehow not making its point? The seriousness of the recent global financial crisis for many nations jolted economic history from its slumber. In the aftermath of the crisis, the Economist magazine asked a group of leading economists whether the crisis would affect the teaching of economics. Their, over their overwhelming response was yes, reinstate economic history into the curriculum. Michael Pettis, an economic theorist, Wall Street veteran, merchant banker, equities trader and entrepreneur, this is all self-described on his website, uh, exclaimed economic history should be at the heart of economics instruction. Is this just rhetoric, though? Written in the wake of the crisis, Carmen Reinhardt and Kenneth Rogoffs ironically titled, This Time is Different, Princeton University Press 2009, and as you can see, New York uh, Times bestseller, um, identified common patterns across hundreds of financial crises of many nations over nearly a millennium. Startling just to think of the research that went into that. And they found common patterns, particularly patterns uh, associated with overpriced assets and uh, indebtedness. So the question then has to be, how did so many well-paid bankers and public officials miss what was happening? And this is quite a serious question. You know, how, could that, how do they miss such clear patterns that have been identified? This book published after the crisis, admittedly, but it wasn't the first time people had written about these things in economic and business history. The financial crisis, as you'll know, barely ruffled the secular boom of, that Australia had been experiencing since the early 1990s. We've certainly had our own share of precedents, but we need to look back a good deal further into our, our history to find serious financial crises. Uh, in particular, we can find one in the 1890s, when the financial crisis was so severe that half of the financial institutions in Australia closed their doors and many of them never reopened them again. This is one, the one occasion in Australia's economic history where its economy did not follow international trends. The rest of the world, or much of the world, went through a climacteric in the mid-1890s. Australia did not had this incredibly severe uh, financial crisis. So can we know when there is about to be a crisis? This is a sort of question, well, you can tell us as much history as you like, but can we really see one of these coming? Financier JP Morgan used to say, perhaps in jest, that once his chauffeur began to buy shares, he knew it was time for him to sell them. Another example here uh, by the great Michael Leining, and I like this one in particular because it's got my, my own name in it. Uh, it's, uh, I love the cartoon, I love the faces in the, 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 the hard-nosed uh, kindergarten kit and the very proud mother and the deferential uh, neighbour or whatever. But it's sort of, you know, when things are just wrong and crazy and out of, out of step, you know, but why can't we pick those things before they, they just blow up in our faces? 
some knowledge and understanding of our economic past is not a guarantee to avoid future economic downturns, but at least it can help us to understand when they are coming and how we might minimise their impact. However, I think the challenge facing Australia now is not that we're going to suddenly be faced with a major global financial crisis again, or one will come. It's more the feeling of standing at a crossroads that we have come recently through this long secular boom that started in the early, unfolded in the early 1990s, during which, you know, let's be clear, we experienced one of the most sustained periods of economic prosperity and regained some of the ground lost in the 20th century. Indeed, in the 19th century, for several decades, Australia had the highest per capita income in the world. It went down relative to some nations in the 20th century. We got a lot of it, quite a bit of it back in the 1990s and into the early 21st century. Um, uh, and then, of course, after that came the global financial crisis, which we were barely affected by. And so the strength of Australia's success in the boom and resilience to the crisis are noteworthy. Casting forwards, though, Australia has set foot in the Asian century, during which it's anticipated that Asian nations will dominate economic developments, particularly China, and that, that region will be critical for us in an economic and political sense. Given the geographic closeness and the trade complementarity, yet cultural and political differences with this emerging centre of global power, Australia faces a set of important challenges in the coming decades. There is an acknowledgement quite widely, I think, of this sense of a crossroads or maybe a turning point come up, coming up. And quite a few um, narrators of the public discourse have started to write books on this question, and some are even using history as a if you like, a predictive lens to try and work out what will happen in the future. Indeed, we've had books written by journalists and public servants and business leaders and campa campaigners all looking to try and delve into our history and understand this for our future prospects. The problem is that a lot of them have gone into it with a predetermined sense of what they want to understand and what they want to explain for the future. And many of them are divided up in two, two schools. One is the sort of um, triumphalist uh, approach, and another is the doomsday approach, the triumphalist approach is that we were always the clever country, we always got it right, um, and we cultural superiority and all those sorts of things, and you, we just need to carry on this way and we will be successful in the future. The doomsdays are the lucky country sort of thing. We've just missed a disaster so many times in the past, and it's about to catch up with us. Um, and so it's interesting that, that that link between past and future is out there, but it's in a way that's not really that helpful in most of these books. I think within academia, there's also this acknowledgement of this, this, this potential, this crossroads. Talked about the post-GFC view on teaching economic history and economics. Talked about the views that have come out of the uh, revisiting of the national curriculum. And I think there's also uh, an attempt to revive a more intelligible economic history, and it's particularly associated with a, a movement that is emerging in American economic and business history called The History of Capitalism, and particularly associated with a group at Harvard under Sven Beckert. And this is not Marxist history. You know, you use capitalism and think, well, everyone that talks about capitalism must be, must be Marxist. It's not that. It's, it's mainstream. And it includes economic, social, political, and transnational approaches to history. So it's very inclusive. It's bringing economic history back within a sort of a history fold, but there's also interaction with economics as well. And I think, you know, maybe I'm being optimistic as an economic historian, but I think I can detect some shifts amongst economic economists and historians as well. When I recently wrote a chapter for the Cambridge History of Australia, not to be confused with the Cambridge Economic History of Australia, a number of young historians wanted to engage me about economic history and expressed the feeling that this element was missing from their training as an historian. And certainly in those volumes, there's one for the 19th and one for the 20th century, there's really only one main economic history chapter for each century, uh, which to me, you know, and obviously in their views as well, 
tells us something about the way economic history uh, needs to, or the concerns of the younger generation of historians, need to engage more with economic history and economic concepts. Um, and from the economist's point of view, I've been pleasantly surprised by the amount of interest amongst economists in the, in the volume, wherever it is, it was around somewhere, um, it's over there now, that's right, uh, keen to, to organise book launches and to review it and all those sorts of things, so it's sort of suggesting to me as well that there's more interest emerging amongst economists. Indeed, uh, a Nobel Prize winner, Joseph Stiglitz, has requested a copy of the book. So what I want to do for the rest of the lecture is look at examples of how uh, an evidence of economic history and how it may help to inform refocus economic narratives about the 21st century, leading us through the 21st century. So I started off, or almost at the beginning, to say, well, here are classic sort of statements immigration leads to higher unemployment, manufacturing decline is a disaster, and all these sorts of things, and take a, a bit of uh, material from the book to look at some of these issues. A starting point, though, would be to say that um, Australian economic history has always had a lot of statistical data. Now, that may put a lot of people off immediately, but it's been generally handled in a very sort of sympathetic and all-embracing way. So it's really been a big theme, and there's a lot of, lot of uh, tables and graphs and that sort of data in the book. And it all began with Timothy Coughlin, who was uh, the New South Wales statistician in the late 19th century, who wrote these voluminous books, Wealth and Progress of New South Wales, A Statistical Count of the Seven Colonies, and, and massive volumes, mostly uh, unacademic in the sense that they weren't uh, properly referenced. But then his work, his, his, his calculations and sources survived, so then in the 1950s, two ANU figures, Noel Butlin, a uh, celebrated uh, ANU economic historian and a famous uh, ANU economist, Heinz Arndt, literally dug up from a city basement in Sydney all of Cochrane's notes on which his voluminous and largely unreferenced publications had been based. And to quote, uh, to take a quote that William Coleman mentions in the first chapter of the Cambridge Economic History, for three days strapped to the waist, we worked in indescribable grime, sorting thousands of volumes onto shelves, but also finding what we were after. Only an historian could take pleasure in reading or experiencing something like that, but it, just to emphasize that point about statistics. A starting point, I think, in saying, well, look, how do we engage, how do we understand how economic history can inform where we're going, is to think about internationalization. So Australia has always had a high level of engagement in the international economy. It's been an export-oriented economy and relied heavily on complementary manufacturing imports. And um, as you can see, Australia's export ratio, that has declined a little bit in the middle decades of the uh, 20th century, but it's now picking up again. And so we've always had this engagement, trade, investment, labour supply, and a very close synchronicity with international trends, with that exception of the 1890s, as I mentioned earlier. So, you know, what are the implications of that? Clearly, international engagement remains critical to our future story. Uh, nor is it the first time that the issue of cultural distance with our economic trading partners has been enunciated. There were concerns about the Americanization of Australia's economy and society going back to at least the 1920s and further back again in the 1890s in Federation, Japanese wool buying firms had already established themselves, such as Kanematsu in Sydney. So there's nothing new about this sort of question of cultural distance or cultural closeness and, and how it interrelates to economic activity. Something that I think is uh, certainly worth looking at is the question of public debt. So we hear a lot of discussion at the moment about whether the level of indebtedness in the economy public debt in particular, is unsustainable. And building of policy, central parts of our macroeconomic policy, around the level of public debt. Well, very interesting to look at the long-term historical data, which is from uh, Maddox chapter in the, in the volume. So as you can see, we're actually, although it's gone up a bit in the last few years, we're actually at very low levels of public debt as a share of gross domestic product. What really drives increases in public debt are economic downturns and war, okay? Increasing expenditure, reducing income tax receipts, those sorts of things. So it does 
motivate questions about how far our economic planning in the coming years should be driven by concerns about public debt. Perhaps fundamental to any question of economics is what should we produce, who should produce it, and maybe where they live. And so that takes us on to a mind-boggling chart there, which we would love to reproduce in colour, but unfortunately that was beyond the budget. Now, the bit that you might want to start off to begin with looking at is, I should have brought my point in, the dotted manufacturing share, OK? If you look down the bottom of the key, the dots of the manufacturing. And what you can see is an approximate U-shape for the 20th century. So this question of um, should we can be concerned about the decline of manufacturing role in the economy is interesting when you put it in historical context, because what has basically happened is that we've returned to manufacturing as a share of GDP, which is very close to what it was at Federation. And the increase in the meantime has been partly due to tariffs, we've got rid of tariffs now, and the expansion of largely non-tradable types of industries. So should we be concerned? So it's nothing you know, historically that looks out of place in terms of data. It's, should we be concerned about declining the manufacturing sector? Manufacturing does not generate a large volume of exports. That's primarily minerals. We can't compete with low labour costs and economies of scale of new manufacturing nations, especially as we no longer have the tyranny of distance. So probably everybody's heard of Geoffrey Blaney's tyranny of distance. It was tyrannical in some ways. It was beneficial in other ways, because it's almost like a form of natural protection. Now our manufacturing competitors are much closer, and of course transport costs are much lower, much more efficient in all sorts of ways. Um, uh, we you know, can't re realistically be in those big manufacturing sectors like you know, car production anymore. There is a role, I think. There is a role in more focused, niche-based, research-intensive types of manufacturing. And, and in this university, one of the research areas that has given some emphasis is in manufacturing. I'm not saying we shouldn't research manufacturing. I'm saying you know, it should be niche, low economies of scale, uh, highly technical type of manufacturing, which will show up pretty small in terms of share of GDP. That brings me on to, so I'm just going to go through these sectors, to natural resources. In spite of the recent setbacks to the mining industry, the, the falling price of coal and iron ore and the, the, the Chinese proposals to, uh, to introduce tariffs, natural resources have always dominated our exports, generally 80% plus, and it's still very, very high indeed. And so what happens here is that people say, this is not a good idea to have so much of your uh, economic activity, or at least so much of your exports, because you can see it's not a huge amount of economic activity, so much of your exports in resource industries. And economists develop this concept of the resource curse hypothesis, which has been debated for half a century now. But it, the, the resource curse hypothesis basically says that economists that economies focused on natural resources are fated to slow growth and belated development. And there are many reasons behind this. Resources come in windfall natures, governments spend their windfalls in unwise ways, there's lack of innovation in these areas, there's all sorts of things, there's something called Dutch disease that you might have heard of, it's not the result of visiting establishments in Amsterdam, but really is a result of too much, too much domination of certain parts of the natural resource industries, attracting all the labour from other industries, pushing up exchange rates and those sorts of things. And Australia has some elements of that, that type of problem. But our research does clearly demonstrate that Australia has been a successful resource-based economy, along with several, several others, such as Norway. Uh, and that these have been successful because they've been very technologically innovative, finding many new products and processes over a long period of time. And so the shift seems to be increasingly to, to accept, though I don't think it's quite made it here, to accept that it's really not such a bad thing to be a resource-based economy over a very long period of time. It's not just a transition to somewhere else or getting stuck in a developmental problem. And research done by the United Nations came up with a nice little phrase. It's not what you produce, but how you produce it. In other words, it's not so much the sector of emphasis of production, it's the quality of institutions and the environment in which that occurs which matters most. 
And just sort of thought you might like to see that, um, which is an example of a, uh, an ocean going carrier of liquid natural gas. And we know this all this amazing investment of technology occurring Darwin, Northern Territories, Western Australia, and so forth, and over this side as well. And this is just, you know, research and uh, innovate, highly innovative types of research. Those domes on that vessel, as you may know, contain liquid natural gas, which is, is, is reduced in temperature to nearly 200 degrees centigrade in order to reduce its size right down, so it then becomes economic to export it. And so, you know, the, the whole, you know, constructing these sorts of vessels and, you know, background is in maritime history, that's an impressive piece of shipping technology to do that. So, you know, the suggestion that we can't focus on resource-based industries and have modern technology and modern growth seems to me misplaced. Now, the third part of that very uh, unattractive uh, chart is the other. The other has many meanings, of course. It's been the product of several films and all sorts of things. But the other, in this sense, is services. It's the omnibus of activities uh, that dominate the Australian economy. So if our angst lies with manufacturing and most of our exports are resources, most of our economic activity actually lies in the omnibus area of services. And again, there is nothing new about this, as you can see from the from the chart. And um, what is interesting, peculiar maybe, is how little the service industries get studied. Individual ones get studied, banking and finance and so forth, but the concept of services and their role in the economy uh, continues to be uh, under-researched. And of course, putting in a plug for our own industry, um, not only are services the so-called elephant in the room, but the biggest services exporter is education and related services, which constitutes about 35% of service exports. So we are an industry which is the largest exporter in the dominant sector of the Australian economy. And, you know, let's hope that uh, this sector is maintained and, and supported in a way that uh, will avoid a perfect storm because, of course, we have coal and iron ore, the two main exporters, under great pressure with falling prices and Chinese tariffs, which I mentioned earlier, uh, and our third grade export is education services. So I guess we say, watch this space. Probably haven't got much time left, I don't know. And is anybody keeping five minutes or so? So the question, the other two questions were, who, who should produce it and where should, they, and where should they live? I particularly want to talk about who should produce it because um, we continue to be a country that has many first-generation uh, migrants in the population and the workforce. And Australia's economic history is partly about the role of population growth and particularly immigration in driving economic expansion and economic development. But what we get quite a lot of in the economic narrative today, of course, is are there adverse effects of uh, high levels of immigration, if that is what occurs. Um, my editing colleague, Glenn Withers, and uh, an old friend of mine, David Pope, sadly passed away now, uh, have wrote, written a classic article, a series of articles, which has shown that immigrants do not rob jobs, to use their phrase. And the reason for this is, is, is actually a fairly simple one, that when migrants come to a country, they both impact on demand and supply, both enter the workforce on an average assumption and also demand goods and services. So the two tend to offset each other. The other interesting thing about migration is, as you can see, highly cyclical. So the, if, you're, if you're getting tired, the, 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 the migration stuff is the, is the darker uh, cycles at the top and the natural increase from you know, births and deaths is, is the rest of it. And so you can see a couple of things there. Not only has migration been highly cyclical, that's not surprising, but it is also um, very much affected by economic trends in the sense that my net migration falls to almost zero during the interwar downturn and rises during periods of high levels of economic prosperity. What that tells us is that uh, our concerns about the impact of migration are probably overstated. 
because migrants are making decisions to come here because there are jobs and opportunities in economic expansion and not to when there is an economic downturn. So our concern that this is driving the level of unemployment is probably uh, reversing the true causality. Realise not much time left. Uh, There's a little bit I was going to say about female-male pay ratios. There's a, obviously a, a sudden big narrowing of those with the equal pay legislation in the late 60s and early 70s. There's still some differential there. Uh, some estimates, I think, about 10% of the difference is due to what broadly termed as discrimination. I'd like to say more about that, but I also wanted to talk about um, where did the population live. Now, one of the things that really surprised me when I came to Australia in 1991 as a migrant, was told this by a professor of economic history at ANU, uh, was that Australia has historically had a very high level of urbanisation. It's not what a British person would think. You'd think that everybody's out there you know, in the fields and in the outback and so forth, but that's just not the case. We have always had, comparatively to many nations, a very high level of urbanisation. And the reasons for this are actually fairly straightforward. Uh, there are a whole series of services that are required in order to convert those primary produce into actual saleable exports. So it's the urban-based stuff, financing, warehousing, marketing, transport, insurance and so forth, are all services uh, and all uh, labour intensive, which tend to occur in urban areas. So to me, it, it, and, and you can see this is a fairly typical thing of settler nations of, of comparable nature, Argentina, Canada, New Zealand and to some extent the USA, that that's part of the settler export primary produce sort of mentality. But I think it's interesting because this concern about do we have too much uh, of our population in the cities goes back a long way. So if we go back to Timothy Cochran again, 1897, he said, uh, the abnormal aggregation of the population into their capital cities is a most unfortunate element in the progress of these states. We still have that unfortunate element today, and it's even more unfortunate because the proportion is even larger. But I would argue that it's not unfortunate, it's explained in economic terms, and that one of the things we should be doing in the 20th century, 21st century is planning for better, larger cities. Look at some of the European and North American experiences. You can have much larger cities, and I think that's the way we're going to continue to do. Um, I had some uh, things I wanted to say about uh, the indigenous population as well, and one of the things that I'm very pleased about in the book, and Vera mentioned, is that ec economic historians have now begun to take much more seriously the impact of economic development on uh, our original uh, indigenous society. And um, there are several important chapters in there, mostly written by the uh, Centre for Aboriginal Economic Policy Research Group at the ANU. And um, this was all initiated by the work of Noel Butland in the 1980s and early 90s, just before he died, when he's having spent most of his academic career interested in the economic developments of settler Australia, particularly the manufacturing growth and, 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 and export in the 1860s and 1870s. His last great interest was in Aboriginal Australia and particularly trying to estimate backwards what the real size of the Aboriginal population was on the Eva settlement in 1788. Economic historians have previously assumed that um, what contemporaries observed was a sort of decline, a state of decline in Aboriginal economy and society by the time of settlement, and, and early generations of historians took that for granted. Butlin challenged that to, to show, and I think convincingly proved that there was a uh, abundant and uh, a successful Aboriginal economy and society in 1788, and what really destroyed it was the impact of European diseases to which there hadn't been, particularly smallpox, to which there hadn't been previous exposure of those populations. And he did some very interesting sort of historical demographic modelling, and he compared it with what happened in India when smallpox arrived there in more recent times without any previous exposure to that disease, and did a, a sort of a, 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 a you know, maximum minimum impact to estimate that rather than the 1788 population being around 200,000 was probably close to one to one and a half million, and contextualised it with all sorts of uh, examples and illustrations of how their economic and social activity worked. Uh, and there was a, there was a slide uh, on that, it really it's just some of the work from that chapter that looks at those areas in which there has been a, uh, a significant closing of the gap in the last 30, 40 years, such as in education and other areas such as employment where uh, there remains a, a significant 
problem to close that gap. Well, there are other things I'd like to say, but, but um, uh, out of time, and that's fine. Um, I just sort of conclude. Um, in a novel written in 1953 by L.P. Hartley, The Go-Between, there's a famous um, quotation there where the book starts with this phrase, the past is a foreign country, they do things differently there. And it's true that sometimes the lives, the stories of lives spent a century or even half a century ago can appear strange and alien to us. And I took this, this picture off the BBC website uh, a few days ago. They're running a series of stories about old English soccer stadiums that have now closed down and, and reopened somewhere else. Anyhow, so this one I thought was quite interesting. This, you will immediately recognise this as being a view of the crowd at the 1923 game between Millwall and um, Southend. <laughs> FA Cup replay, apparently. Uh, <laughs> and of course, and we were talking about this the other day, and. Uh, my daughter Charlotte and I said, what, 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 looks, what looks a bit unusual there? And, and she came up with the right answers, which was basically, they're all men, they're all standing, a lot of them are smoking, you can see some in the foreground, you can see the smoke at the top there. They're all wearing hats, they're all looking really for. And you look at that and you think, that, that can't be us, that doesn't look like us, how could that have ever happened? And yet, the way they lived their lives matters uh, uh, enormously for the way we are living our lives today, the decisions they made. And that generation in particular, I chose 1923, because in the course of the 30 years of which that was in the middle, those generations went through two world wars and into war depression, so huge environmental impact on those groups. And you know, I'm sure many of us in this room have parents, grandparents that fought in wars and grew up through the depression and so forth, as indeed, as indeed I do. So, so that matters, but I, the other point I want to make is that not only did the way they behave and their experiences uh, shape what we're doing now, but our decisions about the way our economy develops over the next few generations will have so much impact and importance for people sitting in this room in 10 or 20 or 30 years' time. So I think I'll just leave it there. Thanks very much. <laughs>